mengumumkan keberangkatan Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Perak Darul Rizwan Sultan Nazrin Muizzuddin Shah Ibni Almarhum Sultan Azlan Muhibuddin Shah Al-Maghfurlah Chancellor University Malaya Diiringi Dif-Dif Kehormat Para hadirin dipersilakan duduk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Menghadap Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Perak Darul Rizwan Sultan Nazrin Muizzuddin Shah Ibni Almarhum Sultan Azlan Muhibuddin Shah Al-Maghfurlah Chancellor University Malaya Ampun tuanku beribu ampun Sebah patik mohon diampun Patik bagi pihak majlis Menjunjung setinggi-tinggi kasih Di atas perkenan duli yang maha mulia tuanku Sudi mencemar duli berangkat ke Majlis Syarahan Umum Profesor John L. Esposito pada pagi ini. Patik memohon limpah perkenan duli yang maha mulia tuanku untuk patik mengajarkan majlis dalam bahasa Inggeris. Menjunjung titah tuanku. Praise be to Allah and prayers to the Prophet Muhammad his family and companions. Pro-Chancellors, Chairman, and members of Board of Directors, Vice-Chancellor, Professor John L. Esposito, Professor of Religion and International Affairs and of Islamic Studies, Georgetown University, Washington, D.C. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Academy of Islamic Studies, University of Malaya, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you to the special lecture by Professor John L. Esposito, entitled, Muslim World in the West and the West, New Challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce Professor Esposito before I invite him to the stage for his lecture. John L. Esposito is a university professor, currently a professor of religion and international affairs and of Islamic studies at Georgetown University. He is also a founding director of the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and the Bridge Initiative, Protecting Pluralism ending Islamophobia in the, Walsh, in the Walsh School of Foreign Service. In 1974, he received his PhD from Temple University with a specialization in Islamic studies and a minor in comparative religions. Previously, he underwent a training in Arabic language at the Middle East Center for Arab Studies, Lebanon, and also at the University of Pennsylvania which renders him a strong ground in dealing with issues related to Islam. Prof. Esposito has been the president of the American Academy of Religion and Middle East Studies Association of North America, among other experiences in the area. Prof. Esposito has written more than 55 books, including Islam and Democracy After the Arab Spring, and What a Billion Muslims Really Think with Delia Mujahid. Being an editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Islamic World in six volumes, Professor Esposito is presently an editor-in-chief of Oxford Islamic Studies Online. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the lecture will last until 11.30 and will proceed in the, ne in the next 30 minutes for Q&A session. Now, without further ado, may I cordially invite Professor John L. Espocito to deliver his lecture. Please welcome. Assalamu alaikum. I'm delighted to be here today. First thing I would like to point out is that I am wearing my University of Malaya tie, <laughs> which I received many years ago. I've been waiting for the opportunity to wear it again, so I'm glad that I'm here. Um, as I begin to approach this topic, and because of its importance, I will probably be looking down more than I usually do when I lecture, because I want to be very clear about what I'm saying. Not just because I think the ideas are, are relevant, but because uh, it can be left uh, to, to misunderstanding. To give you, in one paragraph, an idea of what I'm really trying to say is, is to say the following. The old model for development was Western and purely secular. The idea uh, was that to become a developed nation, one had to become uh, more secular and also copy models simply copy, imitate um, Western models of uh, development institutionally. Today, we live in a different world. Today, we live in a different world. Sometimes rulers of countries don't realize it's a different world. Uh, sometimes academics and uh, other kinds of experts don't realize it. We live in a world of multiple modernities, multiple modernities, not just a single notion of what modernity should look like. There is now a modernity that is not simply tied to and simply blindly imitating the West. The Arab Spring and the post-Arab Spring in the Muslim world, for example, give us a sense of the diversity of those multiple modernities. Rashi Ganoushi of Tunisia and his notion of Muslim Democrats in the way in which Enakhta has actually developed within Tunisia itself in recent years um, is similar to that. What Ganushi is advocating is not simply imposing a Western model, but rather adapting a model, not only in a, uh, adapting a model that has a space for Islam, but adapting a model that has a space for all citizens within Tunisia, but also insisting at the same time that that doesn't mean that it's a model that other countries in the Muslim world should be blindly copying. I remember one conversation with, with, with Ganushi and also public statements of his where he would on the one hand talk about looking, because reporters would say, okay, are, are you looking to imitate Turkey? And he would say there's a lot to learn from the example of Turkey, but there's a difference between Tunisia and Turkey at the end of the day, just as he would say there's a difference between Tunisia and Egypt. The creation of these new modernities is not, then, genetic copying of something that simply and solely came out of the Enlightenment and the West. And again, uh, regrettably, uh, we see in, in, in media and in many sectors of, of Western society, um, and sometimes, uh, you know, in, in countries in the Muslim world, people still thinking that the model is the West, and so your judgment about whether a country is developed or advanced uh, is whether, or, or even, quote, uh, uh, good go has good governance, is simply to look for an exact copying of the Western model. Let me begin by noting, with regard to democracy today in the world, two points. It comes from the annual reports of Freedom House. In the late 1990s, Freedom House reported, in the late 1990s, there was a significant global shift to electoral democracies. But it reported in 2015, in the first years of the 21st century, there was a, de a deduction in democratic freedoms. In 2017, the more recent report of Freedom House, it noted that democracy faced its most serious crisis in decades. 
that 71 countries that were seen as, in one way or another, democracies, in those countries, there's been a sharp decline in political liberties. On the other hand, 35 registered gains, but 71 backed off. And it gives an example, and it's very, I think it's very unusual, uh, as far as I know, for a think tank uh, in this kind of report to give the following example, and that is to look at the United States and our current president. It notes that our current president is an example of the problem, doesn't use those words, but you can see the problem when it, quote, cheered China's ruler. And the phrase that the president used, that is President Trump, I think it's great regarding China's ruler declaring himself to be president for life. For some Americans like myself, we think he would like to copy that in a new world of multiple modernities. He also congratulated e Egypt's dictator and very interestingly, also the current leader uh, in the Philippines. He abandoned human rights improvement as a policy objection, uh, objective, which has been the policy of the United States for a long time. He proposed to cut the funding to the National Endowment for Democracy, and he's failed so far to nominate an Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights, which in fact we've had under previous administrations. Let's turn now briefly to the uh, example of the Arab Spring and its significance. The question after the Arab Spring, having seen it, raised the question, is democracy in trouble or even dead? Are we entering the next round of global terrorism symbolized by ISIS? Or are we currently in a stalled stage in an inevitable process of democratization in the 21st century? This is the theme of a book that was referred to in the introduction, uh, a book that I uh, did with my colleagues John Vole and Tamara Son that Oxford published a year or two ago called Islam and Democracy After the Arab Spring. When we look at the actual uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, what we saw, and in subsequent uprisings, but what we saw in Tunisia and Egypt was a cross-section of society, that's important, and very important, the youth bulge in many countries today, and certainly in the Muslim world, was reflected in Egypt and Tunisia. That is, with that youth bulge, we have more contemporary youth that are simply not satisfied to, to live and suffer under a country that does not allow for full freedoms, uh, a country uh, that um, has a rampant problem with corruption, and a country whose policies rob the dignity. It was very interesting how the youth talked about the fact, in fact, it was even referred to as a dignity revolution. The dignity of, of, of being you know, a, a, a free citizen. At the same time, many authoritarian regimes, particularly in the Arab world, feared a potential political tsunami. They weren't worried about whether the, the Anakta or the Ikhwan were going to come to the Arab world. They were worried that the example might come to the Arab world. And so they saw it as a threat. They saw it as a wave of uh, democratization, widespread democratization in the Middle East, and attempted to shut it down. And some Gulf countries, among them Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, the UAE, actually funded for the year before the movement to bring down that government and funded and have funded substantially that movement post that period. After the fall of the uh, Tunisian and Egyptian government, my center held a conference in, um, uh, in Istanbul. Excuse me, but I have to just drink a little water. Uh, we held a conference in, uh, in Istanbul, and we invited many of the leaders and youth from uh, Tunisia, from Egypt, um, uh, from Syria, uh, et cetera. However different the discussion, there were two things that they shared in common, two issues. 
and I think these issues are really important in terms of what came after it. One, the deep state. That is, the idea that, as one of them put it, gee, when you had the French Revolution, or the American Revolution, or the French Revolution, the side that lost was either killed, imprisoned, or left the country. But yet, our concern and fear is that in our country, even though we've now had this political revolution, the same key players are in place within the institutions of the government, i.e., in Egypt, the Mubarak appointees were still there who were the heads of, heads of the court system, the military, the security forces, etc. And that is why, uh, parenthetically, I have often said there never was a Morsi government. There was a Morsi presidency. You can't have a, be, have a Morsi government if you have no control over these other organs of government, which we saw. These were the organs that actually attempted to bring it down, including the organ that represented, as it were, law and order. Um, the second concern, uh, which also sadly uh, um, came to be, was the attitude of America and the EU. They kept asking those of us who were from the EU or America, do you think that the US and Europe would ever allow, quote, us, not only to have free and fair elections, but more importantly, would ever allow or approve the idea that we might select a leader or, and a government uh, that uh, was independent and, and that they were um, therefore concerned about, that they didn't know what the results would be. Remember that for the foreign policy of many authoritarian governments, whether it's in the Muslim world or, or elsewhere, the, the, the old idea, the old order, was to say, we're the only game in town that you can trust. So, you know, uh, uh, if you don't support us, look at what may come after that. Think about the trip, it just occurred to me now, I hadn't thought about it at the time. Think about the trip that uh, President Trump took to uh, Saudi Arabia when many people felt that given what Trump had said, things like Islam hates us, and there are lots that hate us, uh, Muslim ban, uh, might, we might have to look at monitoring mosques. Many felt that the speech in Saudi Arabia, they wondered that he would even go there and that at some point this would become an issue. But instead, remember what the United States said was the old order, in effect. You can do what you want in practice, we can be close allies, and, and he added this other dimension, which was there before, but for President Trump is a major dimension in any relationship, China, et cetera, business, trade. So in other words, we can do business and trade, cooperate, and we can co uh, cooperate on combating violent extremism. And the rest, you know, do as you like. Now, why in Istanbul was this question raised? How representative was the question would the U.S. Uh, allow or, or recognize what people did independently. We see that in the Gallup polls. I was with the Gallup organization. We did a book, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. Gallup did a world poll for some five years. Every year, it looked at the entire world, and it, it was a, a well-being. That was what they called it, well-being. So it asked people, how do you feel about your life, your political system, your economic system, your family, your religion? But they also had a set of questions that were aimed at the politics and aimed at the politics uh, in the Arab world and the Muslim world. Okay. You know, for example, what do you think of the U.S.? Uh, uh, how about the issue of the, you know, uh, the primary cause for violence? You know, is it religion or is it politics, et cetera? And in the Gallup poll, what we saw was when, they, when we asked the question, the question that came from the phrase that, that some people put after 9-11, you know, why do they hate us? In fact, we discovered majorities in the Muslim world said they admired America for its education, its e economics, and they'd like to see sharing of that, that they admired our system of good governance, freedom of speech, our, as it were, legal system, okay? All that was admired. But when asked, what do you have a problem with? It was that, first of all, uh, uh, Islam and, uh, and Muslims 
uh, were um, not valued in the way that others were valued, i.e. that their lives were cheap, for example. And one can think of an, exa uh, an example of it with the, uh, uh, the, Gulf, the Gulf War. Um, America knew, and I'm sure Great Britain did too, we went out of our way to know every American, obviously, who died, their names, and also those that were injured or missing, and yet uh, never gave the statistics for the number of Iraqis who were killed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, when some statistics were put out, independent statistics that talked about large numbers, like 200,000, et cetera, the Secretary, then Secretary of Defense said, oh, those numbers are wrong. But he didn't counter by saying they're wrong because here's the right numbers, okay? But the second thing that many talked about was that they thought that uh, the US and in general the West had practiced a double standard in the promotion of democracy. Now this is interesting because President Bush himself, George W. Bush in his second term said exactly that, acknowledged that the US, not only he in his first term, but previous presidents, whether Democrat or Republican, had not practiced uh, the, the promotion of democracy in the Middle East, whereas we had promoted it in the former Soviet Union and thought that it could stick. And these were states that suffered under the Soviet Union for years, uh, that were authoritarian, uh, even fully authoritarian, and we felt that there could be a turnaround. Well, what we discovered was the restoration of the old order with the coup in Egypt. We did not have massive demonstrations in the street that then gave a sign of what would happen in the next election and waiting for the next election, but rather in the name of uh, criti uh, a criticism of the, the Morsi government and growing dissatisfaction, you had a military coup. And a military coup, by the way, that symbolically uh, played off religion. When Sisi made the announcement, there were only a few people on stage with him, and it included the Patriarch of the Coptic Church and the Grand Mufti. So it was very interesting. But think about what that symbolism also says in terms of the independence of religious institutions at the time. The post-Arab Spring, what we, some of us call the Arab Winter, saw the restoration of authoritarianism in Egypt, saw the chaos in civil war and sectarian violence in Yemen, Bahrain, and Iraq. So as we look forward, we, my colleagues and I, see a new phase. And ironically, we saw the new phase in the book, but that was based on our experience over the years. And we were basically saying we see it down the line. Or as we put it at one point, the genie has been let out of the bottle. So whether it happens tomorrow or in 10 years, you know, it's, it's going to happen. And ironically, in the last six months or so, we're beginning to see it in some countries already. In the second decade of the 21st century, what we're going to see is that the relationship between Islam and democracy and the future of political Islam are going to be in a new phase. It makes no sense anymore to talk about whether Islam and democracy are compatible. Some people say it raises the question, you know, post-Arab. It has nothing to do with the compatibility of democracy and Islam. It has everything to do with the res reassertion of authoritarianism in terms of what happened. Most Muslims around the world continue to view democracy as desirable and see no conflict with their religious faith. Gallup found that, and, and more recent Pew studies consistently find that to be the case. The retrenchment in the post-Arab spring with the, the military-led coup and restoration of authoritarianism needs to be seen in conjunction with the ambivalence and the failure of the international community, especially the United States and the European Union, to sufficiently denounce that coup. The EU is a bit better. In, the head of the EU went to Egypt, you know, talked about the concern about what had happened, but at the end of the day, both within a short period of time, came to accept the results. And of course, one thing you could say is, well, we have to go with the reality on the ground. Well, you know, I don't know about that. You know, we didn't learn our lesson in terms of the policies that when we dragged our feet with regard to apartheid, but then when apartheid came, we jumped on the train. In this case, they did not jump on the train. The United States remained ambivalent. At one point, um, um, you, could, you could see 
a kind of slowness. Then you began to see the language of even some uh, people talking about a restoration, you know, and we're respecting what the people want. I saw a, a, a YouTube in which they had a, um, uh, a member of the diplomatic corps, an ambassador, and she was speaking uh, uh, to a group in Congress. And the congressperson said, how do we explain U.S. policy? Because remember, the U.S. went f further, but not further in the sense of better, just went beyond the EU in the fact that President Obama refused to call it a coup. He didn't say I refuse to call it a coup. He didn't call it a coup. And when pushed on it, the administration never called it a coup. And part of the reason for that, which makes it even more suspect in a sense, is that the reason for that is that if he had called it a coup, then the US Congress, when one wanted to restore aid to Egypt, the, the aid that we traditionally give every year, couldn't do it, wouldn't be able to do it. You'd have to go through a long, a long process. So at the end of the day, the US and the UK was signaling that the old order was coming back in. And then you could see the old order coming back in when the US and the UK, if anything, drew closer to its authoritarian Arab allies in general, and, and more specifically, uh, two countries in particular, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. We've drawn closer relationships, and yes, the excuse is, not that it isn't an issue, but the excuse is combating violent extremism. But you see, then you go back to the old order. The old order was, under authoritarian regimes, if not us, there'll be chaos. And therefore, the judgment was, well, we may not like these governments, but we support them. But what does that support translate into in terms of the impact on society? In addition to that, you had then the attempt of some of these regimes to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. And in fact, under in the last year of Obama's administration, and more recently under Trump's administration, there has been uh, a move in Congress to declare the Brotherhood a um, terrorist group. And in fact, I remember in one of the hearings, uh, I had in the first hearings been asked by the Democrats to provide a background report. And so I, I then watched the deliberations. And in the deliberations, when someone was saying that, oh, we've, the Muslim Brothers is a terrorist organization, what they got into were the implications in terms of the US. What do I mean by that? The idea that this would then be used, or could be used, with regard to Muslims in America by Islamophobic authors, uh, political writers, etc. To use that to then say, well, let's look at Muslim organizations. And, and it would be some of the accusations that actually have been made uh, that America is influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood. And that Muslim, gov uh, I'm sorry, Muslim communities represent that. I've never said this publicly, but you can get on the internet. There's sort of a characterization at times by some who are my critics that I'm the godfather on this issue. I guess because I'm Italian American, but also people that don't like it's, it, it. You know, it's sort of like the, any relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood, if you write about them, if you interview them, et cetera, you know, that there's something there. And it went beyond that. The United Arab Emirates put out a list of terrorist organizations and included American and British Muslim organizations, not, not even saying you know, that they were specifically, it was basically some of these Muslim organizations were simply accused of that. And it was an indiscriminate. If, if an organization had uh, any relationship or reputed uh, relationship, not just with the Brotherhood, but with any Islamic movement, it would be seen that way. This has tremendous consequences. But what we need to realize now is the new world order that, that's here as a reality, not the political reality, but the new world order from below, and what we may see, we'll see diverse democratic experiences, and the central issues will be those of political power. Issues about what does the nature of leadership look like, political leadership? What about accountability? What about power sharing? What about checks and balances? as well as the role of, and diverse roles of religion and state and society. And I'm gonna to try to be, say this very specifically because I think it's important. There's a shift in the way things are happening and it reflects 
this notion of multiple modernities. A major issue today, then, in the 21st century is whether or not that old order will endure or that the emergence of a new order. Will many Western governments restore but strengthen ties with authoritarian allies? Well, they've done that since we wrote about this and discussed it in the name of security. But also issues of can or will the institutions of power be redefined or replaced? In some countries, I wouldn't count on it for a while given the nature. Can the culture and values of authoritarianism be replaced by or transformed by a culture and values of democratization? I think that when people look and they see a slowness, when you have elections and a government comes to power or you see mistakes being made, they blind themselves to the reality of the democratic process itself. How many years did it take France after the revolution to actually become democratic? Post the French Revolution, the number of people beheaded was unbelievable. I forget the exact, but you can look it up on Wikipedia. It was around 11,000 people. How many years did it take for the US, despite our wonderful documents in terms of our constitution, etc., to actually implement it? We had an American Revolution followed years later by a civil war in which far more people were killed and it wasn't until the 20th century that we began to, in the mid-20th century, to significantly address the question of equality and racism. And so you had all those failures. You know, and yet when we look at other countries, we then allow for the fact that, oh, there was a, it's a blip, uh, the government did do that, didn't do that well. Uh, I, I didn't plan to uh, give this as an example, but I will. Um, just to be very specific, and I, I put a challenge down rhetorically, but nobody's ever come back with it. When people criticize the Morsi government, and the Morsi government, like a lot of governments, made mistakes, but the Morsi government, like a government that, again, of people who were fighting to survive for years and really didn't develop, uh, as in Egypt there wasn't a, a culture of, if you will, uh, political pluralism and, and democracy. People raised questions about that. My comment on it, and I, I've said it uh, in the US, but I've said it at, at the EU, et cetera, is take a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet of the Morsi government on the one hand and Egypt on the other. You'll note the right hand is the Morsi government. The left hand, there's a little symbolism here when I do this, CC. And use critical ca uh, categories, elections. They said, Morsi government played around with elections. Well, I have to say, Gen General Sisi, or President Sisi, has not played around with elections. That's why he wins by 95 to 97% of the vote. There is no playing around with it. Uh, numbers of people killed, numbers of people arrested, m numbers of people tortured in prison, uh, freedoms, accountability. Why is it that corrupt Egyptian mega, mega wealthy people, some of them left under Morsi because Morsi was looking at that issue and they were invited back under Sisi. Um, this is not to simply get into Egypt, it's to use Egypt as an example of, of what's going on. So as we look forward, the question is, will pivotal factors in contemporary democratization movements be realized, the desire and demands for the good governance? Will diverse forms of democratic, diverse forms of democratic governance emerge? And that Muslims themselves envision when they speak of different kinds of good governance. Major polling again by Gallup and continued by Pew points to that. So what are we gonna see now in the future? And I'll wrap this up in five minutes. I operate on Middle Eastern time, so five minutes is. I once was in a, a debate and discussion in Alger Al Jazeera where I was the fourth speaker. The first three went on and on and on. I got up and the fellow said um, that I had less time. So I got up and I talked and then he attempted to stop me after about five minutes. And I said, I'm functioning on Middle East time. And he said when I finished, in Arabic, thinking that I wouldn't know what he was saying. Can you believe 
that the American actually kind of like didn't stop. You know, the first three guys didn't, didn't follow the game plan at all, but I will try to do this in about five minutes. The struggles are and will be in the future between populist participatory democracy, whether Islamic or secular, okay? Both are gonna be there. Think about, again, the example of Egypt. The coup, but then Sisi saying that he's going to promote Islamic reform, not only in Egypt, but in the world, et cetera. So even governments that come in that have a problem with Islamist governments will then appeal to religion, even if, even if they're secular oriented, because they see it as a force. But the point is, we'll, we'll have the possibilities and, and at times the dangers of both author, of authoritarian guided, elite guided democracy and of uh, Islamic governments. I remember a number of years ago at the World Economic Forum, the big thing was talking about civil society. So I, and I was a member of the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders. I love to say that because it was, that statement is so pretentious, it's unbelievable. But when you say it to a broad audience, when I get introduced, they think, wow, he's one of 100. You know, it all depends on how you view what actually the reality was. But in any case, I remember because we were doing civil society, you had the, the spokesperson for different governments would get up in a discussion on civil society. And to listen to the Egyptians and the Jordanians, you know, it was like, oh, in our country we have, you know, 300 civil societies. You know, it was, they were doing the numbers, okay? Even though in Egypt you had non-government, government-regulated organizations or civil society. They were non-government, because that's what it's supposed to be, government regulated. And I happened to be speaking in Jordan at the time, and a very prominent uh, NGO leader, a woman who was now feeling so uncomfortable uh, that she was living in a nearby country, Lebanon, she said, well, the problem was they still had NGOs, but now they were getting royal NGOs, you know, affecting the way they do. In this new context, then, the diversity of experiences, the multiple modernities, that we've had become instructive. One should look at Senegal, Tunisia, Turkey, Pakistan, Malaysia, and Indonesia, for example. And these are all case studies that we, we did in the book. But because the whole point is, if you actually look at these countries, their political systems represent multiple modernities. And if you look at the role of Islam, represent multiple modernities. Islam and democratic governance are far from incompatible. But democratization is a work in progress. And as in the West, a long, long work in progress with its failures and successes. All the countries, uh, not all, but many of them, France and the US, okay, that had revolutions. If you actually look at their political discourse, and when they now look at the rest of the world, the word revolution is seen as a negative thing, never as a positive. And even the notion of violence, the idea is we say we support something as long as it's not violent. We never would have had a successful American Revolution or French Revolution if there weren't violence. The question is if there is violence, who are the players and why is that violence occurring? But it is a long work. While there have been significant setbacks in Egypt and elsewhere, one needs to remember that the processes of democratization are often long, terms, long term and complex. Today we need to think and look about the many cases in which one sees is that it, there's a striking of balance between using democracy as a diplomatic tool against Arab powers while painting an image of regional violence and chaos which then has you draw close to authoritarian regimes and to operate very uncritically. The notions of democracy and authoritarianism have been portrayed as I as entirely dichotomous, as dualistic. Labels that give the democratic US a high moral background over Arab authoritarianism. That divide has now disappeared in some of the relationships that exist today. The real power of the US and Europe to influence is their ability to not only construct a new narrative, and we're not seeing that, Construct a new a narrative that emphasizes self-determination, government accountability, rule of law, and human rights, because that's what we, France, and others say we stand for. But to act on that narrative, we do not see that happening. Failure to do so, and instead accept the restoration of authoritarianism, 
approve aid packages, and even describe a country like Egypt as on the path to democracy, mimicking what the government might say, legitimates the widespread belief in the Arab world and beyond that the US and the EU have a double standard when it comes to the promotion and support. Equally important, it retreats to the old narrative and conventional wisdom in the Arab world and broader Muslim world. That it's a perpetually uh, promoting a violent, that it is a violent and chaotic region or a possibly violent and chaotic region that is incapable of strong democratic reform. This reductionist narrative ignores the realities of diverse multiple materni uh, uh, maternities. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, I think my wife and I may be having a baby then. Okay, um, this, this reductionist narrative ignores the realities of diverse multiple modernities. That is the diverse political context and the role, the diverse role of authoritarian governments in their policies with substantial financial and military support from the US. Failure to significantly shift from a monolithic and essentialist perception of the Arab and Muslim world and policies that focus simply on chaos and violence rather than the root causes, prioritize instead of um, institutional reform, prioritize that stability means security. And that increasingly will be seen as a dead end. As I bring my, my talk to a close, I would just say that one needs to take a look in the next year or so. Uh, and see what's been happening in Tunisia, the situation in Indonesia. When you talk about the pluses, for example, in both countries, one can also look at the other side, but it's all part of a process. Is the wave proceeding forward? It is, and I think that we'll see it more and more happening. Thank you. I think we have a question and answer period now. Um, so is somebody going to call on people? Or I think it's easy if someone else points at them. What a very interesting analysis. Democracy, Morsi government, Islamic secular government, and the concept of security being stability. Thank you, Professor Esposito, for your remarkable lecture. Now I would like to open the floor for question and answer session. For those who have questions, please raise your hand for our committees to pass over the microphone. Could I just suggest, too, that um, we stick to the notion of what a question is? So don't do what I see a lot, where people, in effect, want to give a brief speech. In the words of an immortal song by Leslie Gore, it's my party. OK. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Zahari Awang. I'm not from the Islamic Studies discipline. My field is science, technology, and business. But anyway, Islamic Studies is my interest and uh, my hobby. Uh, briefly, I'm working uh, the last part. I'm working on the last chapter of my third book. The title is Rebuilding Islamic Civilization While Looking at Other Civilizations. Okay, uh, I heard that in the beginning part of your lecture, you mentioned that uh, the Muslim countries should not follow the Western model of development. Yes, that is a very popular opinion of our uh, Islamic scholars, uh, especially in Malaysia. Uh, but I would like to go deeper than that. Uh, in my opinion, yes, we don't accept Westernization, but we accept modernization, right? <laughs> Okay, we have noticed that other civilizations like Japanese, eh, Japanese civilization, and the four Asian tigers of Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, and Singapore, they have gone through the process of modernization, but not westernization. Yeah, I, so, yeah that's yes. correct. So where's the question? Yes, okay, my question is this. I have divided uh, <coughs> Islamic civilization or civilizations in general into ingredients, the ingredients for making a great civilization. I have divided 
into four categories. Eh? Firstly, the spiritual, spiritual ingredients, which is unique, all right? The Islamic civilization, the spiritual ingredient is unique to Islam only. Excuse and me, Western sir, can civilization you please also go straight is, to the question? And the, the question is? Yes, okay. Uh, the second one is the... No, the uh, question is... The question is... I want is, to give other people a chance yes, to yes. speak today. Yeah, yeah, I, I just uh, let me complete the four ingredients. Uh, the second one is the moral ingredients. The third was the human ingredient, and the, the, the fourth one is the secular ingredient. I would say the secular ingredient is the same. Whether it is Western civilization or Japanese civilization, Chinese civilization, Islamic civilization is the same. Well, we are me, achieving. If that's, if that's what you're saying and it's a yes. question, let me tell you that you are simply wrong. And the example I will give you is to look at the secular model in Europe and the United States. Very different. People always say that we're the same, and it's not been the case. The secular model as implemented in the U.S. talked about separation of church and state. In Europe, that did not exist, and only recently have you seen them moving to that. In Europe, you had countries that continued to have a predominant religion, a state religion that often supported uh, the state. Um, I don't wish to uh, cut things off, but we have a limited amount of time, and I think we need to move on to other people. Otherwise, we'll have one or two people having a chance to speak, as opposed to one or two people or ten people having a chance to ask a question. So well, if we could uh, move to... Uh, can, can some, uh, some Thank you. Can, can we have the next question from other members of the floor? Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Shafiq. I'm from the Institute of Islamic Understanding Malaysia. Um, I've, um, with all due respect, Professor, I've uh, unfortunately have not read enough of your works, but I would like to know more your view. Your view is concerning on the the challenge or the threat from the Zionists, since we are talking about the Muslim world and 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 the West, Zionism, the Zionists. Could you the Zionism, yeah. Zionism? Could you elaborate further uh, as to their, 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 their influence uh, in the Muslim world, is it a growing threat? Would you say it is a growing threat? Growing threat? Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I will, but it's not directly related. <coughs> it's indirectly related to what I'm talking about. Uh, I've, I've spoken and written a lot on that um, uh, situation. In fact, before I just came here, um, um, I was circulating a, um, a one of many um, uh, uh, letters uh, or petitions with regard to uh, BDS implementing uh, the so-called boycott, which is very, very, very often uh, misunderstood. Uh, uh, the, the fact is that um, the, um, the situation in Palestine is uh, deteriorated. Um, uh, I was talking to a colleague. In fact, I was going to make this comment at the beginning. Uh, if you want to hear a negative uh, sort of opening, but then there is there is some light at the end of the tunnel, but until recently, not much. Uh, if you go back 40 years, when I finished my degree and I was talking to an American ambassador and former head of the National Security Council, who was in that period of time, 40 years ago, we thought that for sure Palestine and Israel would be resolved. And we thought for sure that, uh, that, that many countries, for example, in the Middle East, would have made significant progress in terms of democratization, not just in terms of wealth and development of infrastructure. And in fact, just the opposite seems to be uh, happening. Um, uh, Palestine and Israel seems to be intractable. Uh, obviously, a political Zionism, uh, I don't have a problem with the idea of, uh, of Zionism as uh, uh, Jews wanting to have a state, but political Zionism as it, is, as it has been playing out under Mr. Net Netanyahu, uh, is a major, major problem. On the other hand, uh, Abbas, uh, Mahmoud uh, Abbas, uh, has not uh, helped uh, at all. In terms of the uh, influence uh, of, if you will, political Zionism or a religiously motivated political Zionism, um, in terms of politics, global politics, obviously that's, that's there significantly. Uh, and it plays out a role in the United States, it plays out a role in some European countries, not all. Uh, and, and, and can play a very uh, significant role. Uh, if you look, for example, at recent elections in the United States, uh, people like Adelson, a billionaire uh, and major supporter of uh, Republican candidates, also is a major 
uh, supporter of um, a kind of right-wing, far-right-wing uh, approach uh, in Israel, and uh, more recently has said that he will bankroll um, the, uh, the building of a new embassy for the United States. It doesn't mean that the United States is going to do that, but I'm saying that that kind of influence could be seen when somebody just articulates that uh, and, and gets that far involved. Yes. Microphone, please. Professor, uh, my name is Muhammad Dahan. I'm a graduate of this university way back in the 60s uh, in economics, not in uh, Islamic studies. Uh, professor, uh, the topic that I want to uh, address is uh, liberal and liberalism. As I understand it, even in the West, it is a debate, but in, Islam in Islamic society, that word has become a uh, negative connotation. So, from the, wor the word, the word, which liberal, the word? liberal, liberal, I didn't liberal use the and liberalism. But I didn't use the word liberal or liberal. No, no, I'm talking about in general. Yeah? Oh, okay, sure. So, because we are talking about Muslim world and the West. Yeah. yeah. And liberal is normally associated with the West. And there's resistance in sections of Muslim societies, including in Malaysia. So, um, looking at Malaysia, what do you think will be the dimensions of being liberal that could be acceptable to, uh, to this country which is diverse and complex? Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, would, I would begin by saying that uh, it depends on, I wouldn't use the word uh, liberal because it can be misunderstood. But I, I would say that uh, in light of the kind of thing I'm talking about, what one would want to see uh, in, in, in any country, including countries uh, in the Muslim world, and, and Malaysia clearly is, is, is one of the significant countries. Um, and I think what the citizens want, at least we see it when we do polling, uh, is good governance, and often that's associated with free and fair elections, freedoms of speech and freedom of religion, um, a, um, a government that is a government of law and order, and a government as part of the law and order is uh, concerned about uh, uh, corruption and a corruption that, can, that often can be either uh, influence a government, or, you know, significant corruption, or, um, or that government itself can promote. I mean, I think those are an equality of citizens, uh, whether uh, it be equality with regard to gender or with regard to religion and race. Uh, I don't see those as, for me, they're, uh, they're not uh, um, necessarily, I wouldn't use words like liberal, I wouldn't use words like you know, Western or whatever. I mean, they're, they're the nuts and bolts of what one would hope uh, in, um, in, a mo in a modern society one would see whether, whether that society was uh, secular uh, or Islamic or Buddhist or whatever. Uh, I think those would be the, uh, the concerns. Is Good there question. any more question? We have, still have plenty of time. Yes. Please. Uh, professor, I attended your talk. Put the microphone closer to your mouth, please. I was, I was very impressed when you said, when you mentioned about clash of civilization, and I was very happy towards the end you talked about the compromise. I can't hear. Between, compromise between the West and Islam. Uh, Professor yourself is a distinguished example of trying to close the gap between the prejudices of Muslim, or as what you said the other day, your topic was Islamophobia. Could Islamophobia? Yeah. Could somebody talk into the microphone? I, I couldn't hear what you were saying. You must be Italian like me. You were using your hands, and so uh, the microphone was. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was just trying to say, how do you see the closing of the gap of uh, Islam Islamophobia, i.e., your expert knowledge on Islam, and how do you transfer that 
to our to our leaders who control the world today, i.e., yeah. Trump and etc. Yeah, um, to be very straight about it. I think I think a major force um, in recent decades um, that that complicates the relationship uh, both. Uh, if you will, if we use the categories between the Muslim world and the West, but also the categories within Muslim countries as well as certainly within the West, uh, is the question of Islamophobia. Uh, now, what I mean by Islamophobia is um, uh, a phenomenon that is anti-Muslim and anti-Islam that, uh, that leads to bias, discrimination, hate speech, and hate crimes. Um, if you want to get a better idea on um, where I and, uh, and my center uh, stand on this, we have a project called, as was referred to, <clears throat> The Bridge, Protecting Pluralism, uh, Ending Islamophobia. And all you have to do is remember bridge.georgetown.edu. If you just go up and look at bridge.georgetown.edu, you'll see how we address that phenomenon. Uh, we do it by having studies that look at it. We do it by having polling that that deals with it. Uh, we have a poll that will be launched at the National Press Club that's been done with ISPU, which is a, a, a Muslim a think tank. Uh, and that poll not only looks at American Muslims today, which usually they do this every year, but also now compares and looks at what do white evangelicals, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews have, how do they perceive uh, Islam and uh, and, and Muslims. We have an, a section there that has, uh, we're into providing an alternative narrative on Islam and Muslims, okay? And what we mean by that is not just that we uh, have articles or that people like myself and my colleagues write books on Islam and Muslims, it's that we actually have living alternative narratives, not essays that we're, we're simply writing. So what we have is interviews that are done with a cross section of Muslims, Muslim entrepreneurs, Muslim professionals, Muslim, you name it, in terms of who, who Muslims are. So you, you, you engage that. And I think one of the most interesting sections, if you look at our fact sheets section, we do fact sheets rather than simply writing articles, we, we, we put the facts that are simply there so that people aren't going to, when you read an article, you can always say you're interpreting or misinterpreting. But these are facts. So for example, if you want to know, uh, in our fact sheet, we have a fact sheet on uh, President Trump. We have a fact sheet on some of the members of his uh, administration, uh, his cabinet, et cetera, uh, in which it basically tells you what's their attitude been about Islam and Muslims, both before they came into office and after, uh, and, and, and what are the kinds of policies that they advocate or not. We do the same thing on think tanks. And the reason why we do that is that it's, as of 2015, you have a situation where Islamophobia has grown exponentially, okay? So on the one hand, there is a positive sense. Muslims, American Muslims, see themselves, and it is a reality, they are economically, socially, educationally integrated, okay? Uh, and in fact, in the area of, for example, if you're talking about education, Muslims, American Muslims are second to the American Jewish community in terms of religious communities, in terms of level of ed education, okay? All of that's, that's there, that positive side. But what those same Muslims will say that they have experienced, or people in their communities have experienced an increase in the impact um, of Islamophobia. And now what we see is you see the rise of the far right in Europe, Okay, and people forget this. You've got that far right recent elections in, I think it was Hungary and Czechoslovakia, where you don't have significant number of Muslims, where you don't even have significant number of migrants, uh, migrants, migrants, uh, jet lag will do this. Uh, so we're into mater maternity and migraines tonight. My wife will say, what was memorable about what you said? And I'll say, oh, I talked about maternity and migraines. But when you actually look at those recent elections where, where you don't have a, a migration issue and you don't have significant Muslims, these people use that as an issue in getting elected. The same was true in Poland. I did a conference in Europe where the Polish scholar got up. It was all people talking about uh, Islamophobia in, in Europe. And she got up and said something like, the good news is, you know, empirically we don't have a problem. We don't have a lot of Muslims. The bad news is we have Islamophobia. 
and it's certainly in the government. The Polish government has shown that it's not only Islamophobic, it's anti-Semitic. And it's interesting, we find in a lot of studies that there's a correlation. Where we see Islamophobia in countries, there usually is a major problem with anti-Semitism. So I think that this is a major force. And why it's significant is because it affects politics. It affects society. It is affecting the civil liberties of, of, of Muslims within that society. You are not simply innocent until proven guilty in, in certain cases. Uh, the, the, particularly if somebody wants to label you or your community, by you I mean the individual Muslim or the community, as somehow violent. So we have uh, 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 groups that are significant in their numbers. A number of them, like Acts for America, have actually had people like the secretary, current Secretary of State, uh, the current uh, head of the National Security Council, not only associated with them in speaking, but giving awards to these folks. And a group like Act for America ultimately says that the bottom line is all Muslims are potential terrorists because if you're a devout Muslim, and you pray and you have your beliefs, you may not be a terrorist, but you are predisposed to becoming a terrorist. Okay. I, you have somebody all the way yeah, back there that's been hands. jumping up. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to directly make my question. That is, uh, uh, P.K. Hittri, uh, Philip K. Hittri, he said that uh, uh, no nation uh, or no people in the early Middle Ages contributed to human civilization as did by the Arabs. But on the other hand, uh, uh, Herbert Spencer, the, uh, the great writer, I mean, he says that uh, this was because of uh, uh, that uh, Muslim were able to uh, take the advantage uh, of the Byzantine or others. So what is your expertise opinion about it? Is it that Muslim only contributed to human civilization only because of the uh, uh, advantage taken by uh, from Byzantine or others, or they have any something. I couldn't quite. Uh, can you repeat the last part? Yeah, the question is about civilization. Um, to what extent Muslims have contributed to civilization, human civilization? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and uh, Albert Spencer, in his book, yeah. uh, 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 he says that Muslim contribu contribution was only because they took advantage from Byzantine and others? Uh, I think that um, there is a, there is, um, a, a movement. There, there have been uh, 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 writers and authors, intellectuals. Um, Bernard Lewis, for example, a very, very prominent writer, um, ultimately switched from some of his earlier positions. And uh, what, what they begin to do is to say, uh, let's start with the fact that most people in the West, certainly when I went to school, it's changed, changed now. Islam was invisible in terms of education, politics, okay? Uh, uh, when uh, the American Academy of Religion didn't include Islam back then, okay? Uh, uh, the Middle East Studies Association didn't cover much of Islam. Islam was seen as something that was the past, not visible and significant in politics because of the presumption that it, quote, shouldn't be, okay? All right. Um, so what that meant at the end of the day is that uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, and I was stunned to discover that there was this incredible Islamic civilization. It wasn't part of my education, et cetera. Uh, and the results of that, not only in its own time, one can talk about the, the, the ripple that came, for example, in terms of the contributions with regard to art, algebra, you know, the sciences, et cetera. Um, I think that the, the tendency has been to, a, uh, to, on the one hand, affirm, which I think is true in, in recent uh, centuries, uh, uh, Western civilization has shifted. So when Muslim civilization was at its peak, we had the dark ages in the West. Uh, in recent centuries, it's been uh, primarily in the West that we've seen uh, uh, many of the, the great accomplishments uh, that occur in civilization, uh, in, in, in Western civilization. That's not to rule out the fact that there's been stuff going on within Muslim societies. Uh, there are many reasons why we don't have the same level of development in, 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 in some Muslim countries, I, I would argue. I can't go into all the, 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 the reasons, but I can give you some. When you've got authoritarian governments, okay, authoritarian governments control. 
And how do you control the mind? You control it in a variety of ways. You control the media, the newspapers, kind of messaging. You, universities, in some Muslim countries, you don't teach international relations or political science, you know, because you're going to get to a topic that people don't like. Uh, uh, you, you control or you attempt to influence even religious institutions. So in some countries, governments suddenly are really being generous. They're going to support the religious institutions. But what it usually means is they need to create a ministry that does it, and then you can have the governments that actually then wind up dictating what the sermons should be or how far it will go. Or you've got to ask yourself in some countries, if you're the, a grand mufti in Egypt, for example, under Mubarak or under Sisi, however good you are, how far are you going to go? And in fact, if you were appointed to it, it must be that the authorities feel that they can influence you. So if you have an impact on the university, and also, if you will, on, you know, on, on, on the university, and I'm using the phrase very broadly here, and the mosque, you know, uh, there can be, they can be uh, real, uh, real issues. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, microphone, please, to the front. Mm. To the front on the left side of the hall from the entrance. Yes, thank you. The mic is passed from the other side, sir. Uh, it's on your left. Right here. Prof. Uh, Don't go. My permission, please. Um, when I come this morning, there are to expect two countries, which I wish to hear that you say something about it. One is Saudi Arabia. When we talk about Muslim world, it is more perceived than factual to the ordinary Muslims on the street. They look upon Saudi as a Muslim leader. The dynamics that is happening in Saudi, in the House of Sound in particular, is of concern to a lot of ordinary Muslims on the street. The second country which I, I look forward for your view and your analysis mm. is Turkey, when we talk about relation with the West, if we can tap your view on this. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a very easy question. Um, <laughs> um, can we shut the mics off? No, I'm only kidding. Um, Saudi Arabia has made tremendous contributions um, to um, the promotion of Islam and Muslim civilization in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, they have, um, I'm talking here about the country. Uh, you know what I mean by the, the government, basically here the government, we, they were, uh, but also private, private uh, 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 Saudis. Um, uh, so, on the one hand, Saudi Arabia has, in many Muslim countries, provided uh, funding for the building of mosques, libraries, uh, schools, etc. Um, and Saudis have been involved in also uh, uh, all kinds of uh, 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 projects within the Muslim world, uh, um, some of them dealing with providing education and social services, uh, particularly in developing nations. Or um, in the case of, for example, my center in Georgetown, Prince Al-Walid, uh, providing an endowment, uh, which then meant that in, in giving that endowment, that that center will exist forever, to the extent that there will be a forever. Sometimes with this world, we don't know how long it'll be. Um, but, um, uh, and I think those, those are important. That is, uh, he was concerned about Muslim-Christian relations, okay? He did the same thing, a reverse, in overseas in the Arab world. He was concerned about uh, Arabs, or Arab uh, education, uh, 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 having a good understanding or a, a good knowledge of, uh, of the West. So he funded at AUB, American University of Beirut, and AUC, American University of Cairo, funded American Studies Centers, okay? So these kinds of things have gone on. Uh, on the other hand, as we know, um, and here I'm not getting into um, the, the development of Al-Qaeda because the Saudi government is not responsible for that, or, you know, uh, it, it's the people who actually, the Saudis that were involved, you know, bin Laden, et cetera. Uh, but, um, uh, but more, more broadly, on the other hand, uh, at times, uh, some of the um, people that uh, were in the, um, in the institutions and, 
and, and doing the funding, et cetera, um, we're promoting a, a rather uh, singular interpretation of Islam. Um, you know, I, the diversity of Islam can be seen very simply in, for example, the matter of dress. Uh, what it means to be, uh, have modest Muslim dress varies significantly from being fully covered in public space in some countries to uh, women uh, and, and having separation of the sexes to completely different models that exist in countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and, and, and many, many other countries, uh, Egypt, etc. Uh, so there's a diversity there. And the same thing should be there when it comes to um, the diversity of interpretations of Islam. Uh, what I mean by the diversity is not, I'm, I'm not trying to say that we're relativizing Islam. I'm saying that the, that, the, that, that the understanding of Islam is done by human beings. So whether they're, uh, whether they're uh, religious officials or whether they're uh, academics, uh, uh, if you will, uh, 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 who, uh, Muslim academics here I'm talking about, uh, who talk about Islam and interpret Islam, it's still human beings looking at the sacred sources and the history doing that interpretation. And I think that one of the drawbacks at times has been an, an, uh, uh, the, the, um, the uh, export of uh, a particular interpretation. Uh, and to be frank, I've seen that in a lot of countries, and I saw it in Malaysia. I'm old enough to have seen Malaysia for a long time coming here. And there, there are aspects of uh, inter, uh, interaction, uh, aspects of uh, cultural things that, that vary. The, uh, the development of? The royal muscle of Saudi. Oh, you mean today? Oh, the dynamics of yeah. OK. Yeah, the, the dynamic that's happening today is impossible to predict. The, the fact is we know that we have a, a new crown prince, okay? And, and therefore, more than likely, we will have a new king in, in, in a number of years, in a few years. Uh, uh, king, king, king Salman is older, some people say, et cetera. Uh, I can't emphasize that too much because he's not that much older than I am, uh, but in any case, that's uh, a little threatening there. I'm getting close to 80, so it's, you know, uh, I'm always very sensitive now about how we talk about our elders. I also prefer that to old people. All right. Um, but the crown prince has uh, advocated a variety of things. So he's advocated and said that there will be a political, there will be a religious reforms. Uh, he's not talked about significant political reforms, at least not in any specificity. So we're talking about, therefore, reforms that have to do with education, opening the society more, women can drive cars, um, um, uh, there'll be movie theaters, uh, et cetera, but how far that goes. At the same time, you had the so-called crack, crackdown on corruption, uh, for which uh, there are uh, more than two schools of thought as to what the purposes of that were, uh, were these people, uh, many of them really corrupt, whether they were the religious leaders that were imprisoned for a long time, uh, or the, uh, the uh, key sort of uh, business people, many of the key business people, etc. cetera. Um, some people you know, said things like, well, how tough is it to be at the Ritz-Carlton? Get realistic about what the situation you know, is in reality if you're, if you're even if you have a suite in the Ritz-Carlton, and that's where you are for several months, and et cetera, w what was expected there. In, ter in terms of Turkey, I think Turkey is extraordinarily dynamic uh, uh, in the last 10 years, and um, it's very difficult to see where it's going. I would say the following. Um, when the AKP came into power, and it came into power because they had an agenda uh, that many people found attractive. Uh, and, uh, and they continue to win votes, uh, I mean, up until the last elections, but certainly in the, er in the early elections, a lot of the votes came from the fact that under the AKP, people saw their, their economy booming, uh, and they saw their society changing significantly. Uh, they saw that it wasn't just secular elites or urban elites uh, that, uh, that had a shot at things. I can remember friends telling me how when uh, Abdullah Gul or Erdogan would be on television, you're sort of a super right secular 
Turk would be looking at television and saying, you know, look at these people like the, you know, from the rural areas. You know what I mean? They, they don't even dress the way kind of we do. And uh, you know, they're not as sophisticated as we are. I mean, that mentality, okay, existing. Uh, it, the situation's gotten far more complicated in the last, last, uh, uh, last five years. Uh, you have, before the coup, uh, a concern uh, about, um, uh, articulated by the government, but also articulated by an emerging opposition, a uh, concern that had significant impact on the politics of Saudi Arabia, and, I'm sorry, of, of, uh, of Turkey. Uh, and I think post-coup, um, you have a situation uh, that, uh, in which Turkey's role is, is, is very multiple internationally. Uh, that is, Turkey, for example, on the one hand, Turkey, like Qatar, uh, is not, um, uh, uh, was sort of, was supportive of uh, the Arab Spring in Egypt, et cetera. And as a result, other countries in the Gulf had a problem with that. Uh, and certainly there's been a, a real strain, as everybody knows, in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Turkey, uh, and between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, with, in international politics, there's a strain, if you look at it today, that's gotten worse in terms of the EU and its relationship with the EU. Uh, both the EU's activities uh, have become uh, strong in expressing their concerns with regard to uh, Turkish politics and Turkey, uh, and whether or not uh, it, it, it falls, th those actions fall within what membership would require. And on the other hand, uh, President Erdogan uh, saying that he's uh, increasingly concerned and disaffected. Uh, on the issue of, um, uh, in, in the post-coup period, on the issue of uh, freedom of the press and, um, and also ref uh, ref uh, uh, the impact on uh, the, uh, uh, sectors of society like the military and education, uh, you have a real attention uh, and a, uh, 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 a conflict not only of words but of realities uh, between sec uh, sectors within Turkish society uh, and, and the government. Okay? And I should mention, just as I said that I was associated with Gallup, I should mention uh, that uh, I have a long uh, experience in Turkey and uh, uh, have uh, have uh, had experience with many of the players, both in the government and outside of the government. But I think I think it, it, the trajectory of Turkey is not clear as it was, let's say, up until about four years ago. Uh, I would have said uh, 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 that Mr. Erdogan had a chance uh, and still has a chance to go down in history as an alternative and significant. Uh, 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 alternative to Ataturk, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, impact and contribution. Uh, given the dynamics uh, 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 that now that exist within Turkey and in Turkey's relationships outside, uh, it's hard to tell. Um, uh, you know, we don't know. No, not we don't know, I don't know. That's the royal we speak. And now. we have the gentleman. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I am Dr. Thabit Ahmed, uh, Department of Quran and Hadith, Academy of Islamic Studies, University of Malaya. Uh, to make my question more focused about the relation between USA and Middle East. Uh, all USA presidents, leaders, ministers make logo, we support peace, freedom, democracy all over the world. We are going to fight for this. Okay. And uh, you mentioned and highlighted for the Egyptian case. Now, I'm going also to this case. In Egypt, we have two cases. One, Morsi and his government, and how he practiced election and democracy, and Assisi and his government, uh, and how he practiced democracy and election. And last time, he won 99%, uh, and maybe he stayed president until the day after, as you know. Now, USA supports Sisi. So what is this game? What's the game? What's the role of this game that America played? Who's followed the others? The other? America, USA follow democracy or democracy follow USA. So what is above the table? What's under the table? What is the role of 
America Democracy Game. Thank you. Okay. Um, I uh, uh, um, addressed it, um, but maybe not as clearly as I should. That's a very good que a question, the way you formulated it. I think that is the question. If you actually look at, again, unfortunately or sadly, you have to start with the fact that uh, President Obama, on the one hand, while on, on his presidency, they recognized uh, 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 the Morsi government. Um, on the other hand, when the coup occurred, um, the, uh, there was a refusal to say it's a coup. That raises profound questions about the uh, U.S. Um, you know, belief um, and, uh, and the close relationship that then began to develop under Obama has now become very close in terms of at least verbally, uh, you know, what is said, um, you know, by the current uh, American administration. And that raises or contradicts, and not only it's America, but uh, other countries in the U EU, not all, but some, it, it contradicts their very raison d'etre, not only in terms of themselves, but even their foreign policy, which is usually the belief in self-determination, democratization, and freedoms. So what they've basically been saying, this is not only what our guiding thing should be, you know, but this is what we are ready uh, to support those overseas who want to move in that direction. Uh, we don't see um, that occurring. What we see is uh, simply uh, the so centralizing the notion of combating violent uh, extremism uh, uh, that that becomes the excuse for referring to a definition that stability requires securitization. And what that really means is stability requires security in the country. And who's going to provide the security in the country? Well, as long as the, you know, th this government, regardless of whether it's authoritarian or not, um, uh, provides security, that that's OK. And I think that that is counterproductive in terms of both the image of the West, but it's particularly counterproductive in terms of the negative impact that it has on the populations of these countries. Can we have um, one last question? Yes. Testing. Okay. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. I'm Muhammad Afiq, Min Abdul Razak, and I'm currently doing Master in Islamic Jurisprudence. I have only one question. Um, what is your advice towards Muslim youth, young Muslims, particularly in, in this hall, in order to face all the challenges between Muslim world and the West? Thank okay. you. I, I think that um, what I would say to Muslim youth, uh, much of it, it I, I would be saying to, to students uh, today uh, it, you know, in, in Western countries, but particularly, let's say, uh, in the Muslim world, I think that this could be your time. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, one sees, uh, if you go back to Huntington, for example, he talked about the fact that uh, we were, what we were going to have is really this, uh, this uh, youth bubble, you know, that in fact the significant percentage of the population, sometimes 30 percent, sometimes close to 50 percent, were going to be youth, okay? Uh, that's a reality. But why it is your time is that the dynamics in today's world with globalization give, can give one an experience to youth in one country of what the possibilities are by seeing what's going on in the world. Uh, about a year before a Morsi, before uh, Mubarak was overthrown, um, I, I used to go to Egypt regularly. I was talking to a young man who's about, probably about 35, um, a very, very good writer and journalist, uh, and who also had decided to also do a degree on the side in Islamic studies. He's now living outside the country. Let me just say that quickly. But I remember we were standing on a street, and he said to me, you know, Professor, you know, think about the fact that I, this is the young man speaking, uh, and, and many of my, uh, of the youth here, uh, and by youth here it goes into the 30s, okay, um, the only president and the only society we've known is this one person, okay? And then within about three weeks, I happened to be reading an article, but the important thing was you didn't have to read the article to understand what the article was saying because they had the picture of, let's say, Mubarak, 
And then they had all the American presidents that he had dealt with, or, you know, interfaced with, which really showed this how just how long that they were in, 30 years, but it drove home what that really meant, the implications. So you got all these American pre uh, presidents, so you could do it with other countries, their leaders, and all the dynamics that went on there, okay? And then you see the kind of static, you know, stagnancy politically in this one country, that you have one man in that country and in others. I think that we now have what the Arab Spring shows is the possibility of a significant transformation and not one that is run by just one sector of society, whether it's Islamist or anybody else. The fact is in Tunisia, in Egypt, people came together across religions, et cetera, and divides because what they wanted was something that everybody in society should want and have, good governance, freedoms, civil liberties. Okay, I think that, I mean, that's really where it's at. And I think with globalization, in terms of uh, Muslim-West relations, uh, there, is, there, is, there are a lot of positives that are happening here with globalization because it's not only youth, but also other sectors of the population in the Muslim world and in the West that with globalization of, of communications uh, as well as travel, et cetera, one really, now we have young people, for example, when they come to university, often, many of them already have a, a leg up on understanding the world in which they exist. What do I mean concretely? I teach in the oldest school of international affairs, okay, the Walsh School, uh, the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. My students now, as opposed to 1993, when I first went to Georgetown, many of them, when they come in, it's not as if, if they're taking a course with me on uh, Islamic politics, women in Islam, etc. cetera, uh, many of them have in high school had world history courses in which they've looked at the religions of the world, in which they've looked at the Middle East, et cetera, okay? And many of them are the products of what uh, at many universities, whether it's uh, Harvard or Georgetown, where centers actually um, do programs for high school teachers who teach world history. We go there, we provide them with free books, free instruction, lunch, Etc. The school, the school systems don't have to invest any money, but just give them time off. As a result, those teachers incorporate a more global approach. And in terms of what we're talking about, Muslim world and West, or you know, Islam in the West, whatever, uh, students are there. Uh, uh, the Center for Arab and um, uh, Center for Arab Studies at Georgetown. Um, we have a relationship so that at the beginning of the year, I'm often invited when they have their uh, orientation for students, okay? What we discover with the students is that unlike years ago, when in fact what you would be saying to them and presuming was that they knew no Arabic, had never dealt with Arabic, so part of the program was gonna be just as they would know nothing about the Arab world, they'd have no Arabic, a fair number of them have already had a year of Arabic, in some cases more, and a fair number of them already have had courses, you know? So I actually sometimes, I forget it, I, I teach a, co a, a course and um, religion and violence, or as I said, uh, you know, dealing with uh, courses more narrowly on Islam and politics. And I'm stunned by some of the students in my class uh, it, because they came with that background, and then for many of them, if they're interested, we have more students who actually study these areas so that by the time they're juniors or seniors in my class, I'm amazed at the sophistication, you know, what they've read, what they've thought about. So I think this really is a time. I think the change is here. In some countries, governments will attempt to, to, to put a lid on it. As I said, the genie is out as a model. The fact is that you could have the kind of Arab Spring that you had in Egypt and Tunisia where it was only the government, if anything, that used violence, and yet a revolution took place. And quite similarly, that had happened years ago in Iran whatever we may think about the way Iran ultimately is played out. You know? And it was a cross-section of society. The concern before was that with youth was that uh, bin Laden's going to have too much influence, you know, or, or ISIS. In fact, what, what did the majority of youth do, including Islamists? They weren't going into the streets and saying the alternative is, is, is to overthrow and somehow impose, you know, uh, a bin Laden or a Baghdadi model. It was completely different. And you also have the numbers. And if you can vote, you've got the numbers. So you become this important constituency in a weird kind of way. In the old days, it really didn't matter what young people did. 
You know, they, they either weren't of the age to vote, and even if they were, they were only a certain percentage of the country, and all the old timers could deal with that. You know, what I always found interesting when I go to, whoop, there goes my ring, excuse me. I don't usually wear a ring, but this is a ring that I got in Madrid. Uh, uh, be, they gave me an honorary doctorate and a ring. I was more interested in the ring than the honorary doctorate. It's, it's a cool way to remember. But I can remember when I went to v uh, uh, visit uh, uh, political organizations, okay, as well as Islamist organizations. I say something like, at a certain time, first of all, it was always amazed you was when you went there, the age gap, okay, uh, which was people were very senior. Let's put it that way. Um, and like some authoritarian leaders, um, they uh, came into power and only went out when they went out feet first, uh, which usually was that they died at a certain age, okay? Uh, but I said, I want to talk with youth. And so they brought in people who were like 35 and 42. And I, I used to kid all the time that what I liked about it for me as I was getting older was that, and, and I would say this, particularly in the Arab world, I'd say, you've got it made. You're, you got Arab youth until you're about 25. Then it kicks in, and now you become an Arab youth leader till you're about 45 to 50. And then if you really get lucky, you now are in the club, the leadership. And if you're there, you're good for the next 10, 10 or 20 years till you fade out. That situation is different, you know, not only in Western countries, but in the Muslim world. If there is a fair election, you know, an open election, Muslim youth are an incredible block. And you can play that role in elections, you can play that role you know, within your society. Thank you all for coming and I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, professor, excuse me, Professor. Could you please remain on the stage for a short appreciation ceremony? I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor, Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Insinyur Abdul Rahim Hashim, to the stage to hand over the token of appreciation to Professor Esposito. Thank you, Professor Esposito and Datuk Rahim. Yeah. <laughs> Ampun tuanku, demikianlah berakhirnya majlis syarahan umum bertajuk Muslim World and the West. New challenges. Patik bagi pihak Universiti Malaya sekali lagi merafak sembah serta menjunjung kasih di atas keberangkatan duli yang maha mulia tuanku dan patik mohon perkenan untuk mengakhirinya. Duli yang maha mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Perak Darul Rizwan Sultan Nazrin Muizzuddin Shah Ibni Almarhum Sultan Azlan Muhibbuddin Shah Al Maghfurlah Chancellor University Malaya berangkat meninggalkan majlis diiringi dif-dif kehormatan